I was in the middle of the summer in Phoenix, Arizona, and the church that I was working with as a youth intern was ramping up for their annual VBS. So the youth minister and I were on the rope for getting things set up. And as you might know, for VBS, that can be a little bit hectic. Um, so we are out and about on our various errands for the day, and we find ourselves at the hardware store, as one does getting ready for VBS. I remember that anxious feeling of, like the, I've got something that needs to get done and we've got lots of things to do, but I'm here and we've got to get this shopping done, so let's hurry it up. That feeling, anybody resonate with that? Yeah, I'm not alone here. So I remember that feeling following me through the store that day. It felt like I had the blinders on, right? I had a goal in mind, probably to stock up on duct tape because VBS, right? Well, <laughs> duct tape, need it, <laughs> naturally. And in order to achieve that goal, I needed to get in the store, get what I needed, and to get out. Because, well, I needed to get back to the church to set up. I mean, it's for the kids and the church and Jesus and God. It's important. So we're in the store. We get what we need, we go through the checkout line, and as we are leaving the doors, we pass the free popcorn stand. I don't love popcorn. I mean, like, I don't hate popcorn. It's not the worst thing. <laughs> but I'd rather not deal with the kernels that get stuck in your gums, and then you're just, like, messing around with it all day, every day. It's just annoying, so I'll just skip out on the popcorn. Thank you. So I walk by and I offer, you know, the quick smile, the glance, the quickly, and then you look away, look down, keep walking. I've got things to do. I've got to get out of here. There's VBS, don't you know? So I look away quickly to avoid any kind of invitation to popcorn eating. I was not so lucky. This kind woman wearing her work uniform, standing there prepping small bags of popcorn to hand to folks as they were leaving, says to me, would you like a bag of popcorn? And just as I'm about to say, no, thank you, the youth minister who I'm with, who's walking just behind me, pipes up and says, yes, we would both love some popcorn. And I said, we would. Are you sure? I guess so, yeah, let's have some. thank you for the popcorn. The employee smiled and handed him two bags of popcorn. And he talked to her for a second, offering his thanks, talking with her about her day. And he handed me a bag as we walked away. We got in the car and I looked at him, kind of funny. I told him, I don't want this popcorn. And he looked at me and he said, it wasn't for you. Sometimes the best gift that you can offer someone is accepting their generosity towards you. I ate the popcorn. <laughs> yes, the kernels got stuck in my gums, and yes, it was annoying. There? They're not still there. This happened a long time ago. <laughs> All right, I do brush my teeth. Last week, Pastor Justin led us into a meditation that highlighted the generosity of God that is happening all around us, all the time. Moments in a hardware store getting free popcorn. The sunrise and sunset. Our very breath. A grace and mercy and love that is in and through all things. And yes, church, that means you. You are the manifestation of God's generosity, of the love that overflowed at the beginning of time. That flows through you. So like, what about when we're not feeling so generous? 
What about the barriers to believing, to really believing that we are extensions of the generosity of God? We can probably all name them. We know what they are and we know what they feel like, those barriers. Like what about our fear of vulnerability? What about our pride and our ego? What about our attachments to materials and material wealth? What about the times that we rush through the hardware store focusing so much on the important things that we have going on? Focusing so much on getting it right for the church and for God and for VBS that we miss the small moments of grace that God is offering us along the way. And if we're so busy that we miss those, how can we really expect to offer ourselves generously? Our story today is one that you've probably heard before. It's found in three gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we're going to be focusing on Mark's version of things today. And to set the scene, we have to note that in the story just before the one that we're about to read, Jesus has gone on to his disciples saying, y'all better start letting people bring their kids. Stop turning away the children. And he says in this story, let the children come to me for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, whoever does not receive the kingdom like a child will not enter it. This is the context for our story today. We're transported onto the journey with Jesus and his disciples as we get into our text, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 23. And I would invite you to follow along with me. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these commandments since my youth. What great news. Awesome. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go and sell what you own. Give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked. He went away grieving, for he had many possessions. The word of God for the people of God. And we say together, thanks be to God. The first thing that we notice in this story is a man who is serious about seeking Jesus. This guy runs to Jesus, falls on his knees and says, good teacher, what must I do? In the Matthew account of this story, the man's question changes a bit. Instead of saying, good teacher, what must I do? He says, teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? In either case, Jesus' response is to not answer his question. Surprise, surprise. Thanks, Jesus. Instead, he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Only God is good. Jesus immediately reframes and reorients this man's question from about the goodness of Jesus or about the good works of this man to the overwhelming, all-encompassing goodness of God. Then Jesus lists the commandments. And he gave the man, he and the man have a quick conversation about discipleship qualifications. Number one, eagerly seek Jesus. Check. Number two, know your commandments and follow them. Double check on that one. Hashtag teacher's pet. (laughs) 
Number three, sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and follow me. All right, bye, Jesus. I'm out. That's a little too much, a little too far. Just before Jesus tells this man this difficult truth, the text says that he looks on him with love. Jesus knows that this guy's heart is in the right place. And Jesus knows how difficult his barrier is. And so before we say anything else, let's be clear here. Jesus loves this man, regardless of his choice to follow him or not. Jesus, in this moment, understands the difficulty and responsibilities of human systems, of money and culture and spirituality, and how when it all comes together, it gets messy and hard. So Jesus looks on him with love and grace. The same love and grace that is extended for each and every one of you here today, that is extended to all of us, all the time, full stop. So the hard truth for this guy, his motivation is the accumulation of wealth and power. His good actions and generosities have more to do with his doing things in order to earn eternal life than they have to do with his being with others to experience life now. This story, church, is an invitation into being rather than doing. It has less to do with wealth and riches as a barrier to the kingdom of heaven and more to do with our own insecurities and vulnerabilities. To be in relationship with somebody is to be vulnerable. By asking the man to give up his wealth, Jesus is inviting him into relationship, into vulnerability, to trust the generosity of God, and then to offer that same generosity into new relationships going forward, into new ways of being with people. See, Jesus is doubling down on what he said earlier concerning children. The kingdom of heaven is for such as these, these children who depend on a community to take care of them, these children who are wide-eyed about the world, not afraid to make mistakes because they know that if they fall, they'll be caught up by the grace of God. So Jesus invites this man now to become like a child. Jesus invites us to give up on the things that are holding us back, to become vulnerable. Church, we're human beings, not human doings. The generosity of God flows through us as we interact with that generosity all around us. And the barrier to that sometimes is our own attachment to doing. Like the man who approaches Jesus, our question may be in the right spirit, but we might be asking the wrong thing. The man says, what good thing must I do? But Jesus doesn't answer his question. He reframes it saying, the only good thing is God. In other words, why are you so focused on being good when God's got that taken care of? Instead, focus on giving yourself over into the generosity of that God in order that that generosity will flow through you. Jesus' command here is a difficult one to reconcile. It's not like a super fun story. Sell everything you own and give it to the poor. Give it up. Become like a child one who is vulnerable, dependent, open to the spirit of change and growth, not preoccupied with the to-dos and subsequent labels of culture and society. Give up everything to God, your worries and your fears, 
your struggles, and your pride. Give up the judgments that you have assumed God and people are making towards you. Give up the expectations that you have placed on yourself. Give it up and hand it over to the only good thing. And then Jesus says, and follow me. Be with me. Be present to the moment. Let the generosity of God become an openness to using your God-given gifts, talents, and acquisitions for the kingdom of God. And not like a brick-and-mortar kind of kingdom with tall walls keeping some people in and keeping other people out. But a kingdom built on a foundation of presence, withness togetherness with bricks of service and mortar that binds it all together in love. This kingdom that invites every person and everything to be who and what it is at its best. No expectations for perfection because we are human and only God is good. No expectations for reward because the reward is in the process of letting go of the judgments and just being with one another in love. The reward is the freedom from the structures that hold us captive to pride, fear, self-doubt, and ego. Jesus says, go sell everything you have and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me, not because I am good, not because you want to rack up riches in the next life, but because being is all there is and it necessarily leads to doing. Great. You follow the commandments and you intern for a church and you plan a VBS and you get all of the spiritual golden tokens. But you walked right by the popcorn stand God was there, giving God's self away in a sweet smile and a salty snack. So give it up, Austin, your need to do and earn and be perfect. So we won't be perfect. Maybe not even good all the time. But if we open up ourselves to the possibility of what God can do in and through us using the gifts and talents that come naturally to us, then church generosity will flow on like rivers of life with absolutely nothing holding them back. Amen.